Hello Transformers fans. Hello gorgeous. Welcome to another History of Transformers edition. It's happening. Just as I sensed it would. Not that surprising, Optimus. I do plan on doing every single year of the G1 line. We're taking a look at 1987 this time. The end of an era. And the beginning of a new one. Everybody ready? A lineup that includes my favorite Transformers gimmick of all time. Look, it's the Headmaster Autobots. Incredible! Yes, the driver of the vehicle actually becomes the head of the robot. And... I've had these overwhelming feelings that something's going to happen. Something big. Just how big? Are we talking Omega Supreme or Trypticon sized? Bigger than that. What are we talking here? 16 inches? Something unbelievable. Don't tell me they went jumbo sized like the old poppy figures of the 70s. They won't. Right, that would be madness. A two foot tall transformer? They definitely won't. Or would they? That's not gonna happen. Yeah, you're right. The price would be astronomical. Plus, how could a child transform a two foot tall transformer that they may not even have the strength to pick up? Of course, I have been wrong on one or two occasions. 87 marked the end of the road of the Sunbow animated series, which featured two episodes for season three and only three episodes for season four. On February 24th and 25th, season three wrapped up with the return of Optimus Prime two-parter, thanks to a massive angry mom letter writing campaign. Turns out Optimus wasn't just old, discontinued stock to be cleared out from the shelves as well as the airways, as Hasbro had thought. Big Red had taken up a special spot in the sparks of kids worldwide, and his death, although heroic, selfless, and something to be honored, left a lot of kids upset, some even traumatized. What happened? Moms wrote in saying, bring that Big Red robot back. My son has locked himself in his room with his Optimus Prime and won't come out until you bring him back. So Hasbro acquiesced, and Optimus Prime was resurrected. What happened, Optimus? <sighs> Darkness, cold, then light. And killed again in Dark Awakening, the final episode of 1986. Until all are one. Goodbye, old friend. I'd love to know the story behind this. Bringing the character back, killing him off again, again with a self-sacrificing death, and then bringing him back five months later for the finale. A plague is unleashed on the universe in part one, which causes the infected to become mad with rage and glow red. All it takes is contact with an infected subject, turning it into the most devastating game of intergalactic tag in history. I'm a pepper. Wouldn't you like to be a pepper too? <laughs> Only one thing can resist the hate plague, an experimental new alloy which stops anyone coded in it from being infected. And so the few remaining Autobots who aren't infected rescue Optimus's lifeless body and resurrect him. Again. Optimus Prime lives! It's true. Our leader is back. But he wasn't just brought back to stand around and give orders. He had to literally save the universe. After teaming up with Galvatron to retrieve the alloy and coding himself in it, giving himself a similar paint job to the cab of Ultra Magnus, which is what I used Magnus's cab for after watching this episode, Optimus travels deep within the Matrix to determine what can stop the hate plague. His answer is simple. The only way to fight such madness is with wisdom. And what possesses more wisdom than the Autobot Matrix of leadership? So with the power of the Matrix, and one more licensing deal from Stan Bush to use his rock anthem, The Touch. The light of our darkest hour. Optimus unleashes wisdom, logic, hope, and love upon the crazed brutes descending upon him, curing the entire universe of its sickness. It's like the biggest, most powerful Care Bear stare ever. Care Bears! It costs the wisdom of the ages. But the Matrix is empty. It's up to all of us to fill it again. But that's what Optimus was always all about. Sacrifice. Sometimes, to get what you want, you have to give up what you'd rather have. Sunbow went to work for the next several months creating the fourth season of Transformers, which started on November 9th of 87. <laughs> Transformers! 
Sunbow's five-part season openers of Transformers and G.I. Joe were always a highlight of fall TV for me, so I was pretty surprised when Rebirth wrapped up on November the 11th, only three days later, followed by reruns of season three for the next several months. Hmm, that's weird. I wondered if they were just making more, but nope. It all started with a three-parter in 84, the More Than Meets the Eye trilogy, and I suppose it's poetic that it ended with a three-parter. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. In Rebirth, a team of Autobots and Decepticons are blasted away from Cybertron to a new world on the edge of the cosmos. Tell me, what is this planet anyway? Nebulon. Enjoy it while you can. Or Nebulos. Inhabited by human-like creatures, except green. The war between the two factions escalates by incorporating the Nebulons as the heads or weapons of the Transformers. We Autobots are always fighting. Must we drag you humans into it too? A concept welcomed by the peaceful Autobots who had always strived to get along with other life forms, and reviled by the Decepticons who despise all organic life. I'm going to blow those creepy creatures clear out of you! <laughs> Not so fast, tough guy! The pairing of organic and robotic wasn't just a case of piloting. The two beings shared something called binary bonding. Hmm, there seems to be some feeling between these two. Which went beyond technological to ethereal. They could sense each other's thoughts and intentions in order to work more cohesively. It's weird. I feel like we're a part of each other now. I know. I feel it too. Never a franchise to shy away from the grim horrors of war, Rebirth shows that even children aren't exempt from the destruction of the Transformers Civil War. Daniel, Spike's son, becomes a quadriplegic permanently during a skirmish. The boy will live, but there's been severe internal damage. And the only way to restore his ability to move is for his body to undergo the headmaster process and merge with RC. And it's the only thing that'll save my son from being tied to a life support system. Granted, it's just his exosuit from the movie, and a toy of it was never made, so it's puzzling why Spike's boy was maimed so severely on the show when it could have just been a removable suit like everyone else wears. I think it's a neat idea. The real star of the trilogy, though, is Spike. Kiss your afterburners goodbye, Decepticon Slime! Who, after a lifetime of hanging out with Transformers, finally becomes one. No way! You've got to see this! <laughs> He does a last-minute switcheroo that saves Cybertron and all of its inhabitants from being destroyed, and restores the planet to its past glory, ending the animated series on a high note. Thanks to you and Spike. But that wasn't it for Transformers Animation that year. The very first Japanese-exclusive Transformers animated show aired, titled The Headmasters, under the guidance of Masumi Kaneda. Tetsuo! Kaneda! Tetsuo! Kaneda! Tetsuo! of Transformers manga fame. The show follows the events of the return of Optimus Prime, but ignores the events of Rebirth, and tells its own alternate version of the Headmasters and Targetmasters origin. It even uses different character models, closer to the toy versions, by Ban Magami, who also worked on Transformers manga. In the Japanese series, which ran 35 episodes, the heads and weapons are not organic nebulons, but robots from Cybertron. Robots, robots, robots. Another major difference is the quartet is led by Chrome Dome, who barely got any lines or did anything in the American three-parter, and the leadership of the Autobots reverts to Rodimus Prime again. If the deaths in Transformers the movie traumatized you, stay away from this series. Several key characters bite the dust, including Optimus Prime, again. Chokang! Kumbu Chokang! Ultra Magnus. <laughs> Galvatron. <laughs> Blaster. <laughs> Although he's revived soon after with a new paint job, Soundwave. <laughs> Although he's revived as well with a new paint job, and Cybertron itself. 
Like the movie, the Japanese show had a rockin' soundtrack released as well in 87, Transformers The Headmaster's Hit Song Collection. The Transformers will return after these messages. We now return to the Transformers. The Marvel Transformers comic rolled along publishing issues 28 to 39, featuring some 87 releases such as the Throttlebots in issue 30 and Headmasters in issues 38 and 39. But the Headmasters took center stage in their own four-issue limited series. Follow the adventures of the Headmaster Transformers and the equally incredible Target Master Transformers in Marvel Comics. Telling a much more mature version of the Autobots and Decepticons coming to Nebulos, penned by the godfather of Transformers, Bob Budiansky. The four-parter contains many echoes of the original tale of Optimus Prime coming to Earth. A battle-weary leader learns that no matter how much a warrior yearns for peace, War is sure to follow wherever they go. An effective tale of the more things change, the more they stay the same, or even escalate by involving innocent bystanders in the war, such as the Nebulons. And the Marvel UK comic continued with issues 95 to 146, as well as a Transformers annual in 1987. Some manga was released in Japan. Tetsuo! And in the UK, a pair of Ladybird and Corgi adventure game books featuring the Headmasters were released. Another Japanese exclusive video game was released, titled The Headmasters for Famicom, Japan's version of the Nintendo Entertainment System, and was similar in gameplay to Mystery of Convoy, another game only available in Japan. And on VHS Home Video, Transformers the Movie and The Return of Optimus Prime were released. Oh yeah, they made some toys that year too. Lots of them! Even though the Sunbow series sputtered out, the toy line was going as strong as ever in 87 with many new characters, and some of the boxes including two characters, since the head and weapon could transform into another sentient being. Plus, the most epic G1 Transformer ever made. What's all the hubbub? It's the USS Flag of the Transformers line, and the Cybertronian Holy Grail. I don't believe it. 22 inches. Are you crazy? Almost two feet tall. This is ridiculous. Eight pounds. This is nuts! A double headmaster. You gotta be kidding! Original retail price of around $100 US. You're mad! With a box measuring 24 by 16 by 9. Are you out of your minds? And the first and only ever G1 toy of Spike. What? I said the first and only ever G1 toy of Spike. What? A lot of what can be said about the absurdity of the G.I. Joe USS Flag aircraft carrier playset in 1985 can be said about Fortress Maximus. It's a miracle. Even by today's standards, the first two foot tall double headmaster is an impressive sight to behold. How did you accomplish that? Record profits, that's how. I only ever saw one on a store shelf. And the next time I went to that Toys R Us, it was gone. These didn't sit around collecting dust in stores. $100 was a lot of money in 87, especially for mid or low income families with not a lot of extra money to spare. And regular sized Transformers were really expensive compared to G.I. Joe and E-Man toys. Not being able to afford it was made an even more bitter pill to swallow for Transformers fans because it wasn't just missing out on a city playset. It was missing out on Spike, the main human character of the series since the toy line's inception in 1984, who had never had an official toy made of him. Not even a little minifigure included as a driver for one of the Autobots. I remember looking at the box and seeing the picture of Headmaster Spike and thinking, can I have just that? Why aren't they selling him all by himself? I'd grow to love the character of Fortress Maximus later on, not just because of his size, but because of his similarity to Optimus Prime, a peaceful warrior who has to fight because no one can do it as effectively as he can. But initially, I was interested just because of Spike. If Spike was the head of this new Transformer, it was a huge stamp of approval for me. Although there is a middleman, or a middle bot, in between Spike and his gargantuan armored up form. Give me a boost, will ya? Since a regular headmaster head would look pretty silly on the body of Fortress Maximus, Cerebros acts as the go-between. Let's do it. In the Marvel comic, it's not Spike, at first, but a Nebulon named Galen who becomes the head of Fortress Maximus directly. 
and it's not until later on that Max gets upsized and requires Cerebros as his head. For the toy, Spike becomes the slightly oversized head of Cerebros, which does look a bit silly. Stupid is more like it. Yeah, the body of Cerebros could have been a bit bigger. Something is terribly wrong here. Look at the size of that boy's head. Shh. I'm not kidding, it's like an orange on a toothpick. Shh. Well, that's a huge noggin. It's a virtual planetoid. Shh. Has its own weather system. Leave me alone. He'll be crying himself to sleep tonight on his huge pillow. <laughs> Anyways, when the head is inserted... Open that hatch! Built-in tech spec readings, like the ones on the back of the Transformers boxes, are revealed, showing his speed, strength, and intelligence. You simply download into the auxiliary memory circuits in your chest. Once in head mode, Cerebros plugs into the ultimate Autobot. Into what? You're gonna find out, cause you're gonna be part of it. Decepticons, prepare to face Fortress Maximus. Fortress is an appropriate name for this walking, talking fortress. My one wish is to never fight again. Well then boy are you paired up with the wrong head and body. That does it! I'm mad! Even in robot mode, he's fortified from head to toe. In addition to his two hand cannons, he has dual hidden blasters that could be revealed in each forearm and fist. Fort Max knows destruction like the back of his hand, literally. Dual cannons on each shin. A giant dual cannon that swings out from the back of one of his legs. And a pair of gigantic cannons that swivel out on either side of his waist. Swivel hip, battle drip. And his fortress mode compartments were still accessible in robot mode to store smaller transformers. Plus some pretty impressive articulation for a two foot tall transformer made in 1987. Way more than the old jumbo poppy anime robots of the 70s. Fort Max was a triple changer. What was that city he mentioned? He could transform into a fortress or city mode which had ramps to deploy rolling troops, a helipad, a spinning radar dish, and a working elevator. And his third mode is a battleship for interstellar travel. Watch this, scrap for brains! Although it basically looks like the robot mode is taking a nap. <laughs> On the Sunbow cartoon, this was just another fortress mode, and he was in city mode when he was flying through space. But on the Japanese series, this is the mode he used to fly from planet to planet. It has a real SDF-1 vibe to it, and doesn't look so bad if you elevate it off the ground to give it the illusion of flight, to get away from the giant robot laying down look. He also included a pair of drones, Gasket and Gromit, who could combine to form COG. Optimus, I've got something. Could be our package. Fort Max had backup for the smaller nooks and crannies he couldn't reach, a quartet of Autobot headmasters. Nebulons and Autobots, prepare to merge. Brainstorm, the brilliant Autobot scientist who invented the headmaster process. The problem is where they would inhabit us when we're in robot form. Correction, the problem is you and your stupid ideas. Not as wacky as Wheeljack or annoying as Perceptor. And he was binary bonded to the equally brilliant Arcana. I choose Brainstorm. His mind is undisciplined, but I find his youthful ideas most refreshing. Hardhead, the tank, was the only headmaster I owned as a kid, being a big G.I. Joe fan that I was. Well, what do you know? He was binary bonded to Duros. <laughs> hey, Duros! Welcome to the club! Glad to be aboard! The brilliant Nebulon military strategist. Chrome Dome, the speedster, rode it till the wheels fell off. The engines have finally burned out. Or that. And his driver, Stylor. How about you, Mr. Stylor man? I'll take Chrome Dome. And Highbrow, the snob, who would point his nose up at even tracks. Well, I fear your logic is faulty. His partner was Gort, who, naturally, Highbrow thought wasn't up to snuff. 
I got stuck with you? I was hoping for someone who at least approached my own intellectual capacity. Well, I'm not too thrilled about the accommodations either. Each Nebulon had some fairly impressive articulation for their size, and could be stored in the cockpit in vehicle mode, bringing back a much-missed gimmick from the original year of Transformers, Diaclone pilot seats. Six Rebel Sharpshooters? Six Autobots. They were accompanied by six sharpshooting Autobots. We are the Target Masters! Whose weapons could transform into Nebulon figures, although with less articulation than the Headmasters. Autobot Target Masters! Let them have it! There were three new molds. Crosshairs, who I like to call the Dirty Harry of Cybertron. Well, you'd better. Thanks to his uncanny Clint Eastwood impression and his Nebulon sidearm. I'm Pinpointer, and I'm an even better shot than he is! And Point Blank, who was full of great ideas to defeat the Decepticons. Oh, by thinking good thoughts? And his passive Pistula. They call me Peacemaker. Hey, uh, where's the Devil Peace? The what? The Devil Peace, my trademark? And Sure Shot, because you can never have enough Autobot dune buggies. Pleasure, sure shot! And his trigger happy buddy. Spoil sports the name, and there ain't a target I can't hit! <laughs> Three Autobot cars from the previous year were reissued with Target Master Companions to freshen them up. The newly demoted former Autobot leader Hot Rod. Alright, Hot Rod is back! Let's party! Came with this hothead. And I'm Firebolt! The old timer, Cup. You know, this reminds me of the time my platoon was stranded on... Got a new Nebulon to listen to his old war stories. Hi, I'm Recoil! And Blur. I did, this is it! I just know it, I know it, I know it, I know it! We're all gonna die, we're all gonna die! This is it, this is the end, we're finished! <laughs> was paired up with what had to be the patron saint of Nebulon to put up with him. I'm called Haywire, and I can nail a Deceptor Creep at 4,000 yards! Ha <laughs> ha! You bet! Unlike Transformers of past years, these Autobots featured spots in their vehicle modes to store their weapons. That's 26 new characters already! But there were plenty more Autobot reinforcements for 87, including another two-in-one character. His head didn't separate into another character, but the Autobot Spy Punch could infiltrate the enemy ranks as a Decepticon! Punch, the Autobot, was the first triple changer that didn't have two vehicle modes and one robot mode. He and his Decepticon counterpart, Counter Punch, You can trust me, Rodimus! You can trust me, Galvatron! Both shared the same car vehicle mode, but each had a unique weapon. The original Autobot twins, Sideswipe and Sunstreaker, looked nothing alike in robot mode but shared similar vehicle modes. But the Autobot clones... Fastlane, Cloudraker! Flipped the script with their nearly identical robot modes and completely different vehicle modes. A race car and a jet. Roger Dodger, Optimus Prime! Roger Dodger, Optimus Prime! And something monstrous joined the Autobot ranks in 87. Aside from Fortress Maximus. Rodimus quit! There's been an accident! The new Autobots are Monster Bots! They're monsters, all right! The Monster Bots! Monster Bots, attack! I'm glad those monsters are on our side. Repugnus, Grotusk, and Double Cross. A trio of horrific nightmare fuel that gave in humanoids the chills. But seeing as they were good guys, they could warm up a room with their sparking gimmick. And they've even got sparks blasting out of them. You can't stop the monster bots! Transformers! Another combiner emerged. You are all my new creations. I, Grimlock, shall call you the Technobots. During a momentary lapse in brilliance, Grimlock creates this highly advanced team of futuristic fighters. And our future will be more secure now that the Technobots are among us. The team of five was comprised of Nosecone. 
Awaken, Nose Cone. Are... are you my father? The only Transformer capable of doing dental work on Unicron. Transform! Drill me a safe passage deep into Unicron's brain. Or that. Yahoo! It feels great to be a Technobot! My name's Strafe! The Jet? Yahoo! Far out! Fantastic! I'm Afterburner! I'm raring to burn neutrons and see some heavy action! The High Strung Cycle. No allowed, Afterburner. They call me Lightspeed, faster than a speeding photon. The car. And their leader. The name Scattershot! They could combine to form this giant. Technobots! Form Computron! Who had a charming way of speaking not unlike a previous Autobot Titan, Omega Supreme. Who are you? Name Computron. Primary goal, obliterate Decepticons. Ever see Firefly? The episode where Simon talks about how smart he is, only to make it clear how brilliant his sister is by comparison? Well, that's how Computron makes Wheeljack, Perceptor, and Brainstorm look. In Computron mode, Technobots have the computational ability of 200 supercomputers. There's a good chance in combined form, Computron may be the most intelligent, sentient being in the history of the world, both fiction or non-fiction. 89.988730%. I don't know, that covers a lot of ground. Einstein, Tesla, Galileo, Da Vinci, Sherlock Holmes, Tony Stark, Dr. Mindbender. When it comes to calculating odds, Computron rarely makes a mistake. And as had been the tradition in previous years for families on a tighter budget, rounding out the Autobot Battalion for that year was six economy-sized rollers. Robots, charge! Unlike the mini-bots of the previous three years, the throttle bots had a gimmick in addition to transforming. You could pull them back and they'd roll forward, similar to the jump starters, but without the flipping transform feature. Unfortunately, the robot mode suffered because of it. I don't like this. The team was led by the first Autobot to ever get an upgraded toy form. Back, I'm better than ever. Look at this new paint job. Bumblebee was very excited to get a new paint job in 87. I've gone beyond being just plain old Bumblebee. I'm a gold bug. And while the others weren't officially recognized as upgrades of previous minibots, they sure did bear a striking resemblance to some of the other 84 minibots. Like Rollbar, who reminds me a lot of the dearly departed Brawn. Mushy, but true. Chase looked a lot like Cliffjumper. Decepticon at 12 o'clock! Wouldn't surprise me if Wide Load was an upgraded huffer. It'll never work. Big waste of time. Not sure whose searchlight would have been upgraded from, though. That's easy for you to say. Your pulleys don't squeak. Ah, gears. I'd know that grumble anywhere. And finally, Freeway, which could be Wind Charger by process of elimination. I think old Laser Breath may have a point. And the Decepticons got their heads in the game as well in 87. Yeah, the Decepticons are headmasters and target masters too. Much to the chagrin of Galvatron. You call yourselves Decepticons? Allowing these filthy organic beings to cohabitate your bodies? Starting with the biggest Decepticon ever made up to that point. Autobots. Prepare to feel the sting of Scarpanock! Who was not the same size as Fortress Maximus. That makes no sense! Rather than putting out a pair of two-foot-tall Titans that year, they decided to reduce the size of Scorpanock from Fortress Maximus. And for those who were lucky enough to have both, a little imagination would have to go a long way. Unlike Fort Max, Scorpanock didn't have a go-between head like Cerebros. <laughs> He had a helmet to help fill out the area a bit, and his head transformed into a regular-sized Nebulon figure. I am Zarak. My Nebulon brain forms the core of Scorponok. It would have looked a lot better if Zarak was a face master instead of a headmaster, and formed just the face since the helmet was a separate piece. 
but that wouldn't have made him compatible with the other regular sized headmaster bodies. I don't want to die! How are we ever gonna fight that thing? Well, I think you've got that covered thanks to Fortress Maximus, who outweighed and outgunned Scorponok. He did possess some impressive instruments of destruction, though. A gigantic hand cannon. A stinger. No, not that stinger. Dual shoulder cannons. A shield with a pincer. Plus a drone of his own, Fast Track. Let the transformations begin. Like his Autobot counterpart, Scorponok was a triple changer. He had a city mode. What the blazes? With ramps like Fort Max. And since the theme of the Decepticon Headmasters was animal alt modes, a gigantic scorpion mode. Scorponok, transform! With crushing pincers. and the aforementioned Stinger. Five regular sized Headmasters made up Scorponok's squad. Decepticon Headmasters destroy! Weird Wolf, the Wolf. With Monzo. I am to be bonded to that creature? This project was a bad investment. Skull Cruncher, the Crocodile. With Grax. Crocodiles are really clever. Boy, crocky they strong. And the hypnotic vampire bat, Mindwipe, who believed the powers of the dark side were greater than any technological terror. The powers of darkness are a more powerful weapon than all the toys your science can muster. His unfortunate Nebulon companion was Vorath. Ah, me, a top hive scientist paired with a mangy knight scavenger like you! The other two Decepticon headmasters were triple changers that had a third jet mode. They were called the Horror Cons. Apeface, the gorilla. Binary bonded to... I am Sprasma! And Snapdragon, a dragon dinosaur thing. Back off, Snapdragon! With his little buddy. And I am Crunk! Snap Dragon! Both horror con heads were triple changers themselves, with humanoid forms as well as robot mode head and beast mode head. The Transformers will return after these messages. We now return to the Transformers. Decepticon Target Masters, attack! The baddies got five Target Masters of their own in 87. Three of them new molds. If I have to wait any longer, I'm gonna bust a gasket! Okay, okay, you're next. If you thought Skyfire had a potty mouth... Butt out, deceptive bum! Wait till you hear Trigger Happy. Welcome to the scrapyard, auto bombs! And his target master partner. Call me Glowpipe, cause I wanna blow those rebels away! The zingers continued with Slug Slinger. Your history now, auto bozos! Slug Slinger's here! And his gun bud. Uh, you can call me Caliburst, cause I never missed a shot in my life! But you've never taken a shot in your life. See what I lie to you? And the hapless duo of Misfire and Aimless, who both must have gone to the Imperial School of Sharpshooting. Can't you hit anything, Aimless? What'd you expect? I knew it, this! And the two jets from the previous year were reissued, like the Autobot cars, with new Target Master partners. Cyclonus teamed up with Nightstick. The boys are coming, Nightstick! I hope you like busted heads! Yeah! And Scourge joined with Fracas. And what of my weapon? It's me, I'm Fracas! And if you think Bullpipe was bad, I'm worse! 
And you're louder. Now discover the clones, Decepticon clones. Look identical, but one transforms into a puma, the other into a hawk. Puma? Who pronounces it puma? The Decepts got some clones of their own with wingspan, the eagle, and Pounce, the puma. The Autobots may have had a two-in-one warrior with punch-counterpunch, but the Decepticons got a six-in-one soldier. Six hot! Show them what a one-robot army is! He's a jet fighter! That's one! He's a rocket car! That's two! He's a tank! Three! A winged wolf! Four! A laser pistol! Five! Keeping the tradition alive of releasing a life-sized handgun every year for kids to blast each other with, or play pranks on their parents. Uh, get the let out, see? like Athens, back in the summer of 83. Oh, that poor dog. Well, we still got one working testicle. Molon Labby! In a year already so heavy with new gimmicks like Headmasters, Target Masters, Clones, a Six Changer, and a Double Spy, how about one more? Behold the Duocons! Galvatron, our jet's gonna crash into a tank! No, it's not! They're going to transform into one robot! Transformers that were made up of two vehicles that could combine into one robot. I guess you could call Cog a Duobot in that respect. Battle Trap consisted of an Apache helicopter and a Ford F-150. and flywheels split into an F-4 Phantom II and a howitzer tank. Nice to see alt modes based on real Earth vehicles again. Soundwave's tape army grew by two. Slugfest, the Stegosaurus, and Overkill, the T-Rex, gave the Dinobots nothing to worry about. And the Technobots met their match well, not intellectually, but physically, with... Terrorcons! Terrorcons, horrorcons, monster bots. Scary ear. The team of five consisted of... Blot. I'm glad to feel sick. <laughs> Aw, sorry to hear that, little guy. What did you eat? Uh. Rocks. Yeah, that'll do it. Cutthroat. Ripper Snapper. Ripper Snapper don't want to stop now! Sinner Twin. Roll! Rip Metal! Eat food! And the leader, Hunger. A real Philosopher King. Hunger! Hungry! Hunger! Angry! Hunger! Hungry! Roll! Like the Technobots, they could combine. Terracons merge and become Habermanas! The Terracons turned into a giant! Yeah, they sure did. 
Thought you guys were supposed to be smart. Guess that's just in combined mode. Abominus wasn't the thinker that Computron was. Computron, think too much. And although he's so stupid, it once took him an hour to cook minute rice. His raw brute force did pose a serious threat to the brilliant behemoth. Estimated probability of victory in one-to-one -one combat, 48.027%. Datum, Abominus's grip unbreakable. While there were mailways that year, there wasn't anything new and exclusive offered like the Omnibots or Power Dashers from previous years. Just another chance to get Optimus, Megatron, and some of the other 84 and 85 characters that were no longer available in stores. I suppose it's the only meritorious way out of a meretricious situation. Yeah, me too, like he said. One place you could get new, exclusive characters, though, was in a distant land. You know, they must be spread out all over the galaxy. Well, not quite that far, but across the Pacific. Just like they took the Headmaster's concept and ran with it with a full new animated series, Takara in Japan went the extra mile with the Headmasters by offering even more heads that were compatible with the standard Headmaster bodies. Their Fortress Maximus included a gigantic Master Sword, and some new tape beasts for Blaster as well as a new paint job and name, Twincast. And Soundwave got a new paint job and name as well, Sound Blaster. Sound Blaster. And the Coupe de Grass. The train bots rolled their way through the land of the rising sun like a bullet. Six, count them, six trains could be connected in vehicle mode. Each had their own robot mode, and all could combine to form the giant Raiden. And if that wasn't enough, Hasbro's Battle Beasts line, as it was known in North America, Battle Beasts, war, fire, fire, burn, war, was released under the Transformers banner of Beast Formers. Twenty-eight Autobot and Decepticon Beast Formers were released, featuring the same kind of rub symbol the North American counterparts had revealing allegiance to fire, water, or wood faction. <sighs> there, finished. That's it for the year of Head On. Time for me to head out. I regret! Because that's it for 87, little guy. I'm very glad to hear that. And now that you don't need me anymore, please deactivate me. Thanks for watching. Appreciation to the Patreon tribe. There would be no History Of series without your support of the channel, so let's all give them a thanks. And appreciation to the channel panel. Everyone who has hit the join button. Let's see those Autobot and Decepticon custom emojis in the comments. So what was your favorite part of 87? We're thinking. Leave a thought in the comment spot. I'll bet you do. Give the video a share, and to join the tribe, binary bond with subscribe. Do it. See ya in 88 for the most powerful year of Transformers. Nerd mistake.